Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today. We're talking about June 13th, 2023, and I'm always happy to be in our Space View Park in our Gemini Gallery here. Look at this Gemini Gallery that goes up to the two, the iconic Roman numeral two for the twins of Gemini. On those pylons are the handprints of our heroes, my heroes in the 1960s, the Gemini astronauts. Marty Winkle is my co-producer. Hey, Marty, how you doing on our Streamlabs there? All right, doing good, Mark. How are you? Well, good. I wanted to say, Marty, it's always, you know I'm always anxious to talk about anything Gemini. And it is Gemini like Jiminy Cricket, said NASA back in the 60s. Jiminy Cricket, somebody says out there, yep, go go watch uh, uh, Pinocchio. And you'll know who Jiminy Cricket is in the Disney world. But uh, yes, I love talking about the Gemini program. It was so exciting. And the reason we're talking today is that on this date 60 years ago, a company was given the contract worth $8 million back in 1960s to build the spacesuits. In a sense, some of them became one-person spacecraft when they did a spacewalk outside the two-man Gemini spacecraft. So we're going to talk about uh, about the contract that the, uh, was given uh, for the uh, spacesuits. Of course, that was uh, with the um, David Clark Company. All right, up in Massachusetts, tell you a little bit about them and how that evolved. As, as uh, we're going to have a stay curious, also a little bit about Sally Ride across America. They're celebrating the 40th anniversary of Sally Ride's first American woman to go to space, and a couple other nuggets out there that William Whiting, Marty, William's got his green Spartan shirt on, I can see up there, waiting to watch us today, and uh, we got Joel Jacobs, anxious to see Stay Curious today in Columbus, Georgia, Connie McDaniel, she's watching, she said, and I'll bet Gary Gerald's kicking the mud off his boots as he's settling in after a hard day's work up there on his peanut farm. So we hope everybody chimes in. Tell your friends to watch us on YouTube. We're going to make a big move to go completely off Facebook channel to YouTube here in a couple weeks. So I hope that you follow us because that's where the money is and that's where the world is now with video podcasts. So let's kick it off, Marty. Fingers crossed for a Streamlabs program here without any problems. We're going to clear our inventory of the Cali shirts. We have not, not a whole lot, but we've got enough that we can have a little sale on them here. And you just hit that QR code. And for 20 bucks, you can own an original work of art. In the left is Chris Cali, his, his uh, Gemini 4 spacewalk that we're going to talk a little about today. In the, in the other two t-shirts are Chris Cali's famous father, Paul who was one of the first artists allowed on the Kennedy Space Center property uh, in 1963. In the center is his sketch of Neil Armstrong, sketched and been finished later in the suit room during that historic suiting up Apollo 11 on July 16th, 1969. And then Mr. Paul Kelly's power to go that is only like four stories tall on a wall at U.S. Rocket Center in Huntsville. So uh, we were selling them for 25, but they're all going to be 20 bucks. And this is the promotion we had last fall. We printed some more of them for our shuttle fest and we're going to get rid of them at 20 bucks each plus shipping about 10 bucks get two or three of them in there and uh, get some gifts uh, so you're, to your friends there. Well, this is a photograph that I took a couple years ago when Marty and I went to the Udvar Hazy Space Museum and had a great time. That is Mercury Atlas 10. And Mercury Atlas 10, you say, Mark, wait a minute, the last of the program was Mercury Atlas 9, Gordon Cooper, that's correct. But there was a lot of speculation that a three-day mission might be flown with Gordon, with uh, Alan Shepard, the first American in space that did the suborbital flight. He wanted to orbit really badly, and it was hoped that this Mercury capsule right here could be turned into a long-duration orbital mission in late 1963, and it was even given the designation MA-10. And, uh, well, that was canceled in 1963 on uh, January 10th. 12th, so it had been in the newspapers today uh, in 1963. Uh, 
they probably would have flown another orbital mission with Shepard had Gordon Cooper's not been such a, a good success, though he had a lot of system failures uh, in a day and a half in space. Still, everything was pretty nominal. But this Mercury capsule at Udvar Hazy Center in Washington, D.C. is number 15B, is one of two that are showing uh, the configuration flown to space. And thank you, uh, Jim Bailing, good friend of ours, Jim. Uh, Jim Bailing uh, added when I posted this on Facebook yesterday, two sets of additional batteries and a water tank are attached to the retro rocket package to enable a three-day mission. And that's why that looks a little bit different there, the, the water tank being on top and the batteries uh, underneath those stripes that the retro pack is under there. So J thanks, Jim Bailing, for pointing that out. Jim is working at the Kennedy Space Center, and he's a former Space Hab ground operations person for the Boeing company. So, uh, Jim, thank you for staying curious with us. And uh, pretty cool part of space history. Uh, he, this was even named Freedom uh, 7 uh, Roman numeral 2 in tribute to his historic Freedom 7 that was painted on the spacecraft. So a good bit of history that I got to see firsthand there at the Udvar Hazy space as this would have flown had it not been canceled in 1963 uh, at this time of year here. All right. So, like I said, I love talking Gemini. There is my friend uh, Chris Cowley's beautiful painting of the Ed White spacewalk. And it's he's an artist. And, uh, you know, I say to him, Chris, you know, uh, you waste it. Put something up there in the half of the... You wasted half of the painting there. Marty he needs to put something up there in the black and everything, doesn't he? No, he doesn't. He knows what he's doing, and, and it's a great uh, artistic uh, rendering there of that spacewalk. And boy, you see some of his illustrations of some of the photographs, and Chris is spot on, just unreal, uh, how he interprets his own impression of these iconic images. And that's my point. The Gemini images are iconic images that the contract was given 60 years ago to uh, make these spacesuits. And Marty, 60 years from now, six decades from now, the iconic images of the space age will still be Ed White in one of those spacesuits. So I love looking at happy birthdays. We got a happy birthday today. Uh, this is a, a, a four-time flyer. Somebody I hope that we get to see out the Space Center, Ron Graby. Ronald John Graby was born June 13, 1945 in New York, New York. He's a veteran of four shuttle missions and 26 days in space. He was the Group 9 in 1980, and uh, he was on a Defense Department mission, so he can't talk about that. But STS-30, uh, he... Uh, uh, there he is in later life. STS-30 Ron Graby was involved with the Magellan Venus-bound spacecraft, and then he was on STS-42 and 57. And Marty, uh, we had Ken Bertarami, our UFO colonel and the Air Force expert. Uh, he uh, actually taught Graby uh, some of his, uh, how, how the mission on STS-30. Uh, Ken Bertarami was a, uh, a trainer with the astronauts in their simulators on that. So he knows Ron Graby very well. And I told told Ken V that uh, it's his 78th birthday to die, Ron Graby. Um, he flew F-100 aircraft, and uh, he was in the Vietnam, of course, 200 combat missions, uh, became involved in a private business sector. He was at one time was president of Orbital ATK, and uh, which has been merged into by Northrop Grumman, I believe. And he is on the world-class speakers and entertainers circuit there. So uh, hopefully they can afford him someday to come out to Kennedy Space Center. He'll look a little bit like that when, if and when he does. So, All right. Sally's night is going on, okay? Sally ride plus 40 years. And my mom's name's Sally. And, and I'm going to be m telling my mom that uh, we're celebrating her all over the country here. Uh, from an afternoon at the ballpark to afternoon tea, museums and centers across the United States are celebrating the 40th anniversary 
of America's first woman in space, Sally Ride. Unfortunately, she passed away about 10 years ago of cancer. And uh, her historic ride was June 18, 1983. And she was a member of the, of the STS-7 Space Shuttle Challenger crew. And it was only the third time that a woman had gone to space in 1983. Of course, Valentina Trishikova was the first one 20 years earlier. And then Svetlana Savinskia, she did two flights. Uh, and they put her up just before Sally did her flight, just a, a month ahead of time. Since Sally ride 40 years, we tally that 71 women have followed her to space on orbital flights. There's another 11 that have done suborbital flights that are women, which I think is great. Uh, Sally Ride, uh, uh, a stamp has been named after her, okay, a forever stamp there, beautiful forever stamp. Um, as part of the celebration, and I'm so pleased all over America we're celebrating this wonderful woman who everyone I talked to that knew her, worked with her, uh, found her to be very engaging, very intense person, okay, uh, and she was she was very driven with science and technology, engineering, arts and math, and STEAM education is what her museum in San Diego is all about. Well, on June 17th, Saturday, the Museum of Flight in Seattle will host a Sally Speaks 20-minute TED Talk style lectures with uh, all kinds of uh, people coming on hand there, including a couple astronauts, Dottie Metcalf Lindberger, uh, and Blue Origin Senior Director Erica Wagner is going to be on there, some NASA engineers. That's a, a, a TED Talk in Seattle on Saturday. Uh, on the 24th, uh, Houston will host a, a special presentation with Megan MacArthur. Uh, and there's a full calendar of events at the nation's capital. Uh, where they're they're doing things at the Smithsonian and all the twenty some Smithsonian affiliates around the country are going to be doing something to commemorate Sally Ride, and out here at the Kennedy Space Center they're going to have a giveaway these items there that they posted on our on their website to celebrate forty years. They're going to have a um, two days of discussions. Uh, I know. Uh, 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 Connie McDaniel's excited to go out there and see these and have a little sip of tea maybe with uh, Kathy Thornton and I know Kay Hire's going to be out there uh, so they're going to do that for two days have a panel discussion at the visitors complex and uh, it's going to culminate on Friday uh, Janet Cavandi's also going to be out there and they'll receive some commemorative gifts. And then I have been to this museum, Women's Air and Space Museum in Cleveland, Ohio, Marty. And they are going to have um, a rocket day at the Burke Lakefront Airport, June 16th. So that's a cool little museum right up there next to the Cleveland Stadium, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Sci Cleveland Science Museum, and the Women's Air and Space Museum. And that's their Hall of Fame, actually, is on the shores of Lake Erie in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, Sally Ride says a, uh, very little. Basically, she's a very private person. But here was one of her famous quotes. Young girls need to see role models in whatever careers they may choose. You can't be what you can't see. And I love that quote. I've had that on my desk a few times. You can't be what you can't see. And that's what Sally Ride is all about. And that's why we love our astronauts, men and women out there, inspiring the next generation, wherever they are, uh, with the, their, their, their stories. So, of course, we are very proud here at the American Space Museum to be the only place in the world where you can lay your hands on Sally Ride on the bronze handprints in our Women in Space Gallery, where we honor all 72 women who've orbited the Earth, and then some of them who are suborbital ones, and we even honor the three women who are uh, leading our major NASA centers. So, uh, Sally Ride the uh, uh, weekend, uh, so everybody embrace that, and uh, uh, thank uh, God that, that NASA put these women in space uh, in the 1980s and let them pioneer their way uh, to being the excellent astronauts and space cooperative people they are. Marty, comment? Yeah, Mark, I want to help make your day and read a comment we received from O.S. Walker. This is the most underrated channel on YouTube. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. 
Uh, so uh, we try hard, don't we, Marty? And uh, we take it. We I take it way too serious sometimes, but uh, we uh, we we have pride. Everyone here at this museum is like that, Mr. Walker. We all take pride in what we do, and we're so passionate about preserving the birth of this incredible American space age. Think of anything else in America that you're more proud of. Yeah, maybe the Corvette or the the Mustang, but <laughs> but it's uh, what Marty. The Yankees. The Yankees, and Marty said the Yankees. Yeah, uh, yeah. Corvettes, Mustangs, and Yankees, and then the American Space Program. But uh, thank you very much, and 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 we're we have the full backing of our great director here, Karen Conklin, and our board that is is now uh, segued into uh, the new renaissance of rocket people here on the Space Coast. Well. One of my very favorite things in our museum is this board that was at the restaurant Ramones, known for their Caesar salads in the 1960s. Uh, we had the uh, owners of Ramones on here, the 90-year-old uh, mom and her daughters. Uh, you can check that out on your YouTube channel. But this is, they celebrated like no one other restaurant, put up names and banners of the astronauts and welcomed them home and so forth. And this was a permanent banner that had the, permanent wall that they had put up a wood banner there with gold leaf of each astronaut. In fact, Neil Armstrong's misspelt there. They have N-E-A-L instead of I-L. And uh, I always talk about this uh, being a, a teenager in eighth grade in 1965 and 66 when this was going on. No, I was in ninth grade in 66. I didn't go to eighth grade twice, you smarties out there like Dave Stange. Um, so Think of, in the 60s, what was the Twitter of the day? In other words, how would you find the most up-to-date way to find out that Ed White had started his spacewalk? How would you know about it, Marty? Because we had three TV channels. Only one of them had TV news in the morning, NBC. And then they all three came on the after, uh, in the evening for a half hour. That was your news cycle on TV. Uh, newspapers were king. Morning papers came out, Titusville morning paper, then the Orlando paper in the evening down here. So you had two cycles with that, but a lot happened in between those 12 hours. So where, how would you find out this? Well, AM radio, folks, okay? AM radio was the, the quickest way at the top of the bottom of the hour. They'd have a newscast. A lot of them, like where I grew up in Finley, Ohio, south of Toledo, CKLW was the the uh, big blasting station out of uh, Windsor, Ontario, outside of Detroit. And um, you Michiganders and Buckeyes know who I'm talking about. So at every 20 minutes they had news. So you'd be listening to your earbuds in the radio. And I remember, and it was hard to really get information back at that time. So not only did you not know much about the missions going on, but you had no idea about who was making stuff and where it was built and how it was built, unless you were really, really uh, into it, I guess, back in the 60s. So we're going to tell you some things about who built the Gemini spacesuit. All right. And by way of that, on June 13th, 1963, the contract for the Gemini spacesuit was signed by the David Clark Company, a man named David Clark, he signed it himself, all right? And who was David Clark? Well, he was a um, manufacturer of uh, uh, textile, he's in the textile business, located in Worcester, Massachusetts. The company was founded in 1935 by David M. Clark. It started as a textile business with the development of unique knitted materials for undergarments and over time evolved into making aerospace and communications related products. Now they're not making so many spacesuits as they are headsets and undergarments for comfortable uh, pressure situations and that includes aviation. But uh, the definitive contract was signed for an estimated well, back in 1963, Marty, $829,594.80 was the government contract. Where do they get the 80 cents? Let's round it up. Uh, and, of course, I am big on adjusting for inflation when we throw these numbers out 60 years ago. And basically, it's, it's 1 to 10. Anything 50 or 60 years ago, just put a zero behind it because, yep, that 830 
thousand dollars is eight point two million in 2023. So, uh, boy, that put David Clark on the road to success for sure. The the, the uh, Gemini space uh, suits each was developed with a unique requirement for each mission. After all, each mission did not have a extravehicular activity or spacewalk. Uh, and a cut, one mission was the long-duration 14-day flight that Jim Lovell and Frank Borman were wearing here on the right in this picture, what's called the G5C American suit that was easily removed during flight and provided greater comfort and didn't need the hard hat uh, situation they had there that you see the Gemini 10 flight of uh, Commander John Young on his second flight and rookie Michael Collins there. Um, well, the iconic images of these uh, are, are just ingrained. This is a spacesuit, all right? And this is basically the Gemini spacesuit. was constructed of two layers, an internal rubber neoprene pressure bladder, and an aluminized cover layer, which was designed to provide thermal insulation and control the ballooning effect of pressurization. And then the suits incorporated B.F. Goodrich helmets, gloves, and additional hardware. Why? Because B.F. Goodrich made the Mercury space suit, which was basically a full-bodied high-altitude pressure suit that was developed for Navy fighter pilots at high altitude. So uh, David Clark got this contract, and here you see Gus Grissom and John Young, of course the GT3 commander and pilot, in their flight suits that look whitish, okay, in there. But in their photo session, they actually painted a few of them silver, all right? And uh, I've relied on some other sources in here, but according to also astronautics.com, um, these uh, were, were aluminized covering uh, uh, for the, uh, the, f the photo effect is what they probably think on there. However, their actual suits look more like were actually this, just white covered. Grissom, Grissom and Young wore G3 suits. They even got the serial numbers on these things. Um, the suits may have been revised before flight or training articles were being worn in the photo. That could have been a training article with the silver on it. Uh, and then we, we're going to look at a couple other suits here. Here's the um, the uh, uh, the spacecraft commanders of 6 and 8 N3 wore the G3C, okay, here. This suit that, um, that's Neil Armstrong, of course, on the left, commander of G Gemini 8, and uh, future commander Moonwalker, um, and who just turned 92 uh, years old, David Scott. Uh, David Scott's wearing a similar suit that Ed White would have worn on his flight. I'm not going to give you the numbers because I'm going to mess them up and then someone's going to call me out on that. However, as we found out from our good friend uh, Nick Thomas, the astronaut wrangler at Kennedy Visitors Complex, Gene Cernan had special pants that he wore on his EVA and we'll see about that in a second. Here's a comparison between a regular, let's say, Gemini spacesuit this, uh, uh, that's not going to be used for an EVA. That's Gemini 9 leaving there. Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan behind him. And Gene Cernan's got darker pants on, as you can see there in the back. And we're going to see a close-up of those. Those are his EVA britches that had metal in them because he was supposed to wear a, a mobility pack that, ex that the gas was hot. That was the movie around, and so it wouldn't burn up his pants. Uh, but here's the Gemini 6 14 day flight of Jim Lovell and, um, of course, um, uh, uh, Frank Borman. And see the softness of the helmet, and, and, and uh, it was just more like wearing a leisure suit or, or sweatsuit, I guess it'd be sort of equivalent to, the, to that space suit there. And then here are the GT. Six uh, astronauts, Lovell on the left, Borman on the right. Afterwards, okay, you see how that helmet just kind of slips off like a hoodie there. So very interesting how how that could be, you know keep you alive. It's got the rubber and so forth, keeping your. And I always wondered about the feet. The, the feet they just end up kind of using, kind of shoes. And I I never really asked people, Marty, if you need a lot of uh, circulation in your toes. Well, this is Gino Cernan's. Uh, 
uh, testing out this mobility pack that, of course, he didn't use because he got overheated. It was a spacewalk from hell, the second spacewalk in American history after the 20-minute Ed White euphoria in space. Uh, and then the GT-8 got canceled because of the aborted uh, thruster situation on Gemini 8. So David Scott didn't get the spacewalk. And when... When finally Gene Cernan did, he had a lot of trouble holding him. He never even got back to put this thing on. But the pants were made out of a metal uh, material. And here they are at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex out there at the uh, Apollo Saturn V Center, Marty. You can see the difference in them there. I'm going to, that's a picture I took years ago. I need to get a closer look at that now that I know what I'm looking at. Iconic images that we will always remember and never, ever forget. You better believe that. And that's, uh, that's part of the, uh, uh, the beauty of the space age is there's Ed White that 60 years from now that will still say man in outer space. Thanks to David Clark Company there. And I'm going to take us a quick trip back to the our... Uh, Gemini Gallery out there, our, our Walk of Fame, to show you the beautiful, iconic imagery up there. That is the VAB, just on the horizon in the background on a beautiful, puffy day when I captured this image. Those are space workers that gave us $100 to have their name etched as, as part of the Gemini program back in the day. And a look back at the Gemini program one of the last looks back in a spacesuit built by David Clark. This is a selfie taken by a uh, uh, 94-year-old Buzz Aldrin, all right, uh, on his Gemini 12 spacewalk there. So, Marty, we're going to wrap it up here with that look down the beautiful bricks. And on, the, uh, on each side are the iconic handprints of each astronaut. There is Tom Stafford. 92-year-old Tom Stafford. Keep chugging along, my friend. He, and he has been a friend of the museum, not a personal friend of mine, unfortunately, but I've talked to many people that have met him. And uh, here, in fact, uh, here he is, 92-year-old. Uh, there's his handprints. Wait, where are we going, Mark? There we go. The general's handprints there. Uh, Paige Schechter's watching, and Space Monkey's watching, and Aubrey, K-H. All right, Aubrey. Larry Pushkar, I think you put your hands on there. I know Carlton Bailey's put his fingerprints on all those handprints out there. Uh, good to hear, see you, Carlton. Cynthia Rossi is out there. Robert Laws in Dundee, Scotland. Uh, Litza uh, Della Porta. Uh, Litza, you are over in Europe somewhere. I, uh, I think you're actually in the Ukraine, but I could be wrong. Will Tigers is watching. Hazel Banks. And she's got a nice glass of tea in her hand there, Hazel, sipping on a tea on a super hot day here at her home on Merritt Island. Uh, but uh, Tom Usiak's up there with a, a soda in his hand, I think, Tom. But there is the general, Tom Stafford, a couple years ago in front of the Gemini 6 spacecraft that's in his beautiful museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma. O.C. Walker, thank you for your kind remarks. Tom Celentano, he knows how to stay curious, and he helps support our museum. Joel Jacobs, thank you for watching. Joel uh, is in Columbus, Georgia. All right, and that's one of my favorite uh, Georgia towns is Columbus up there. Uh, we already gave a shout-out to Bill Whiting. He's got his uh, Go Green Spartan shirt on up there in Michigan. Dave Stang, he's saying, go blue. Okay, we'll have those guys duke it out here in the museum during football season. Daniel DeYoung is looking sharp in his airline captain's outfit there as he's a pilot for uh, Spirit Airline. And Charlene Walker, that's a new name. Charlene, glad that you're staying curious with us today. So hope that you've enjoyed our program there too space heroes of all of us baby boomers of course wally shara and tom stafford man wouldn't you just love to be hearing what's being said on the walls there that's uh the uh the two um um flight crew uh uh suit room people there forget their names so hope you've enjoyed this program if you hadn't if you didn't please don't tell anybody okay but uh i'm gonna do a self 
plug here is I have been asked to be a presenter at Astronomy on Tap Orlando. So I'm going to present my astronomical parody, Starry Night Live, on next Tuesday at uh, the Oviedo Brewing Company in Oviedo, Florida, about an hour from our museum here. So I'm going to enjoy uh, doing that with... Uh, uh, some new friends up there, okay, and look forward to doing that a lot up there. So uh, with Kenny, uh, Kenny's my new friend up there. Kenny's a, uh, a uh, uh, Kenny is a uh, solar, no, he's a solar system astronomer, Marty. And uh, Kenny uh, is going to have a show here with us on Exoplanet soon one day. So Starry Night Live is a shtick I've been doing for 30 years. And uh, as you can gather, that's where I kind of got familiar with being uh, able to pull off Stay Curious and, and have us have a program at the American Space Museum that everyone can enjoy at all levels of ages, talking about science, space history, and uh, the occasional uh, astronaut birthday. So, Marty, thank you for a Streamlabs job. We are doing something right as we've not had any problems today Ast astronomy on tap orlando they're saying hi to us okay so thank you guys and i'll be plugging your official stuff here uh when they do the news release on me it's just a week away uh they're revitalizing that this is popular all over the country as uh, uh they've mixed up uh, science and beer all right that's a better combination than pints and pistols, I think, that there's a, a place called that here in town. But, uh, no, all over the country, particularly the big cities, there's usually a monthly event where some space geeks can talk about their, their uh, th whatever they're doing, uh, mostly serious astronomy things. So I'm pretty much going to blow their minds with Starry Night Live and the parodies that I come up with, thanks to all my buds at Bays Mountain Astronomy Club and Bays Mountain Park in Kingsport, Tennessee, and you know who you are, uh, George Fleener and Mike Chessman out there. So, all right, Marty. Well, thank you all for a wonderful day on here at the American Space Museum. You made it so by attending our Stay Curious program. Like I said, please tell your friends to watch us on YouTube as we strive to bring you special guests and programs that no one offers about space history out there. So, 60 years ago, David Clark had that contract to build the, the uh, spacesuit for Gemini. I failed to mention that they did not get the contract for Apollo. That went to L.C. Dover. And we'll have a program about them because that will be fun to talk about because Marty L.C. Dover Company that built all the Apollo spacesuits is called Playtex in the world out there. So we can talk about ladies' garments one day here on Stay Curious and how they made spacesuits. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again and talk about the space shuttles of the month of June, all to bridge the space between us. <laughs>